years, but at the point of putting a roof on this building, the, the, the value of the building is going to increase incredibly. I'm thinking to uh, per probably $100,000. Now, if you brought in woodworking equipment inside the building, after you put a roof on it, you'd be able to start making your own arched windows. Windows are not a big deal when you have woodworking equipment. We could start making our own windows and putting the, putting the arched the windows into this place. And then once you get the windows and the, and the floor put in it, then you're starting to get something. With this, uh, with the value in, in this situation, once you made this building livable, you're talking uh, getting up into the several hundred thousands toward the million mark of the value of the property. I'm saying you can't lose by putting the investing into that stonework. So you're suggesting that uh, several people come together and purchase this property? Well, I'm just giving it as an idea. I'm just giving it as an idea that right now we need to take into consideration um, the scripture of the Lord, the first church. We're closing up the last chapter of the earth here. So we need to take we need to go back to considering the church that Christ established. And in the first church that Christ established, they sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continued daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, and did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all people, and the Lord added to the church daily as should be saved. Now, we can't, uh, I say that if you're wise at this time, it's time to give up the American dream. Mm, amen. You can't, <laughs> uh, the American dream is, is it's a nightmare. nightmare. <laughs> it's an American nightmare. Yeah. So now is the time to go to word the Lord Jesus Christ and begin to live the first church that he established. When we began to live for one another and realize that we're the family of the Lord. And everyone has talents that can be used by the group, by the family. And so I'm, uh, I'm encouraging people right now to uh, consider selling their possessions, consider selling what they have or bringing what they have. And put it together into, uh, we're going to survive by community because we're going to feed one another. We don't have to worry about not being able to buy or sell. And then there's so many safeties. In a, in a community situation. Now, uh, the word commune and community <coughs> didn't come from communism. They took the word communism from community and commune. Yeah. The first community was the, the first, uh, as a matter of fact, Karl Marx stole his whole plan for the Communist Manifesto from the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Mm. You go on the college campus and you start talking about the gospel and you'll hear the college students come and say, that sounds like communism. Well, sure it does. Karl Marx stole it from the Bible. <clears throat> so it's, it's them there. The, the, it's, not, it's not Jesus Christ. It's not... Uh, uh, so um, the community that the Lord established is the church. And the church is not going to survive unless it has what the gifts that he gave it, which is, means that we need to recognize apostles and prophets. We can't make it without what God gave us. And a, to be an apostle and prophet doesn't mean you have to look like a game show host. <laughs> like Bob Barker. That's what the, you see, God sends me to churches to tell them when they're, you know, a problem that I see in the operation of the church. Like he just showed me one recently. I was going to this church and I see some unique things because they don't want to impress me. To them, I'm a nobody, I have no value. You see, if you have a, if you have a nice dressed person that, that looks like they have something, they act real polite and kind to them. They, they act a certain way in front of them because they might be going to give a donation. Right. Or they might be, you know, going to add in some way. Or they might think how wonderful is your <clears throat> ministry here. But to me, the pastors don't care. 
They think I have no value, so they just act to me like they really are. And so I get to see them for what they really are. I was in one church, and the congregation was telling the pastor that they wanted to hear me speak. <laughs> and so the pastor says, okay. He said, I'll, uh, I'll set it up. So before the congregation, behind the pulpit, he spoke to me. And he said, uh, Larry, he says, I've talked to the congregation. They want you to speak. He says, we're going to give you a date. And he gave me a date. And uh, he said, yeah, we want to hear you speak. Well, I came on that date and uh, he just interestingly had planned something else. <laughs> and so I, he came to me and I said, well, uh, the congregation, you know, you, you were, you're going to give me a time to speak. He says, you're not speaking here. He told me pr privately. Ooh. But before the congregation in the pulpit, he told him he was setting me up to speak. So the congregation don't know. Oh, wow. So he came and lied to, to them and came to me personally and said, you ain't speaking here. Yeah. Um, I went to, a, to another church. And, and so God, he lets me see things. I just recently, I went to another church and... Um, they wanted, they were talking about God's miracles. The miracles that God's, they're praying for people and their people are being healed. He says, if you have a miracle of God, fill out this form and put it in the offering. And, and we want to know about these miracles. He says, we don't want no lies or nothing. We just want, you know. So, I wrote down my miracle when God increased my 150 gallons of heating oil to 500 gallons. He increased it right and he filled my oil tanks. He filled my oil tanks. I had 150 gallons of heating oil and he increased it to 500. He packed them tanks to where the guy couldn't get in another drop. Yeah. I had ordered more and he says, I can't put any more in there. <laughs> says, them tanks are full. I said, whoa, how, how, I thought he, he can't be right. How could they be full? But anyway, I wrote out my miracle and put it in there <clears throat> nothing they, they don't even want to hear about it and, and, and the last time I was in the service he was he, he emphasized miracles that happen here with us with our church and I, I was I was thinking about that and I thought that's that's not exalting God that's exalt using God to exalt yourself. That's building your, that's using the power and the miracles of God to exalt yourself. What God does anywhere is to be, is to give honor to God. If God heals a person across the street and you had nothing to do with it, that's God. We're supposed to, if we're giving glory to God for His miracles, it's wherever and whoever. We should be, but they just want miracles that happen there, which is, saying look at us which is which is going to lead to an interesting thing because when when God it, God doesn't want to encourage your pride so when he stops these healings or these miracles that's when some religions come up with making their own I mean if you've built a ministry on saying look what God's doing over here and you're building your own pride and, and, and so God stops and you got to come up with something Benny Hinn. Yeah, the little buzzers in the pocket. Or the, yeah. You know, the, the, I was in one church in, that I was a, a little bit familiar with. Yeah. They had a what they called a prophet in. And uh, he called this girl out. And he was telling her all about herself and that her dad was a highway patrol and, and all that. And they're going, wow, how did he know that? And then later on in the service, he was talking about the girl, about communicating with her on the email or something. And then he turned and, and looked right at her mother and said, that, Mom, if that's all right with you. And I'm thinking, well, he wasn't supposed to know who her dad was. Well, how did he know who her mom was? Yeah. Yeah. I think they, they get together before the service and, and they talk about the congregation. And so they put on this show. It looks spiritual, but anyway, that's them. I'm not into playing spiritual games. I'm into walking with God. In, in the first church is the direction that we need to go in order to 
feed one another in order to survive the onslaught of what's coming onto this planet. Because they're in to shut us down, but being together, we are not going to be shut down. You see, there's many safeties that are built into a community, and one of them is all the eyes. One of them is all the eyes. We, there's so many eyes in a community that we're watching each other's back, and we're watching each other. And another thing, if a marauders come around, they're not looking to uh, approach a bunch of people. They're looking for the individuals that are, you know, hiding out by, their, uh, with, by themselves. That's who they want to find. If they see a lot of people, they're going to they're gonna head on by. They don't want to mess with that. So we have uh, um, the hand to help out. We have the ability to give each other a hand and, the, and to work together for each other's success. And that's what this gospel tells us, is to look to, the, to each other's success. Not just to look on our own stuff, but to want to one another's success. We have the opportunity of success in a community. But this community that's fitted for the end times is the church that Jesus Christ established with the gifts that He established it with. And this is the uh, the only way that we're going to survive. This is what's coming. They have uh, plans. Of course, you see the plans and you see that their ability, they're much more powerful than we are individually. But as a unit, uh, there's so much I want to tell you, but I'll try and... Uh, uh, if, if ten minds are working together without competition, that's equal to any hundred minds that are working together with competition. Mm -hmm. yeah. if, a hum, if a hundred people are working together with their minds without competition, that's probably equal to ten thousand people working together with competition. You mean without ego and pride? Right. And without working for ourselves, we're working for one another, one another's success. Yeah. Then we have the capacity of a much greater uh, mind power if competition. Competition is, uh, is death. Competition is the opposite of love. Competition is separation. They, they have uh, reasons for competition. One of them is they get people to spy on each other. That's how the whole military is policed, is through competition. Competition is the opposite of love. It's a poison to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Bible says that to compare ourselves among ourselves is foolishness. Competition is foolishness. We have learned competition. I was thinking of how the... You know, as far as the, our race primarily are the ones that are the biggest on competition. We need to take uh, some notes from our red brothers. How to live together without competition. How the, that's the scriptures teach us to esteem one another as better than ourselves. And that, you can't have competition. Competition doesn't work if you're loving one another as you love yourself and esteeming others as better than yourself. Competition will not work. We need to get rid of the competition. And if people are serious about survival, um, we need to uh, bring together what we have. We need to uh, become a community. It's time to not, to, we can't be living for ourselves because ourself is not going to survive. Individually, we will not survive. But, uh, but as a community, we have the opportunity of not only surviving and surviving well, but we have the opportunity of enjoying our survival. That's the main thing of life, is having brothers and sisters to love and, and to get love from. So, our... Uh, to encourage one another and to uh, look after one another is life. Human beings are what life is all about. There's no life without human beings. We can take all the, 
material possessions that we can find and stack them up in one great pile and it's not worth one human life. And when we come close to death, the, the life that flashes before your eyes is going to be all the relationships that you've had. And it's going to, your death is going to be painful according to how you've treated other humans. I uh, feel sorry for those that just believe that there's so many fish in the sea that I can treat people the way I want. I always find more people. But you see how many ever people... You see, if you met somebody for just 15 minutes, they'll still be in your memory the rest of your life. And how you treat other people, even if it was negligence, at your time of death you'll realize the value of life and realize, when you realize the value of life, and you realize you can't go back and change anything, that's pain. If you've done that to a lot of people, then your death is going to be very painful. So that's why right now we have to be paying attention to how we're treating people and how we're relating to one to another. Are we being honest? Are we being ourselves? Are we being upfront? Am I respecting that person? We need to take those things into consideration now because even though there's a lot of people, we're going to be accountable for every person that's ever been in our life and how we treated them. So we ask God to forgive us and we go uh, paying attention to right now in this moment is what God wants us to be paying attention to. So uh, we need to become community. And we need to take what we have and we need to bring it together because the American dream is done with. We're not going to survive by ourselves. So working together as a community is how we're going to survive and the only way we're going to survive and the only community that I want to be a part of is the one ordained by God. And Jesus Christ established this church and I want to honor Him by continuing on with what He started. We were thrown off course when the Catholics tried taking over. They put to death 73 million Christians. They talk about how many of these people were killed and how many of those people were killed. Well, I want to say 73 million Christians were put to death by the Catholic Church called heretics. And they used uh, technicalities like they didn't believe that the uh, wine and the biscuit turns into the literal blood and, and flesh of Jesus Christ. So that you were a heretic and they had put you to death for that and that's still on their books. So when they decided to take over, they said they thought they had done it. When they put to death 73 million Christians, and they said they made a public proclamation, and they said if there, if there be any other belief, let them speak now or forever hold their peace. And that's when Martin Luther went and nailed his thesis to the church door. And they said, Martin Luther, don't you realize the whole world's against you? And he said, well, then let it be known I'm against the whole world. Amen. Amen. Thank God for Martin Luther. One man stands up and nails his thesis to the church door and it changed the world. But they, they changed to their belief system, but they never changed the church back to what Christ has, had established. And we're still running today with that artificial one that was set up by man. The church that Christ established is the one in order to truly honor Christ, we need to go, uh, we need to um, go in the direction. Now I realize there's, there's, uh, you know, some people can say, well, how do I know an apostle? How do I know a prophet? How do I know how to do this? It don't matter if we know how to do it or not. We got to obey God. What God says is what we, what we have to do in order to please Him. To be obedient to Him is to follow His word. I don't care if it's complex or what. Some people say, well, I don't, I can't understand uh, the King James. I got to have a, well, I really don't want to understand the word unless God gives me the understanding of it. Amen. That's all I want to understand is what he gives me. Because that we can only learn through the Holy Spirit. Man is not capable of giving spiritual understanding. 
We've been following man and his institutions and all of his stuff for, for way too long, and this is the mess we've got into is 150,000 different varieties of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's all supposed to be okay. Well, that's one belief, and this is another belief. It's not okay before God. And if we follow in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's going to tell us what the belief is. If we're following man, then man tells us what the belief is. we got a whole bunch of different variations. we got to stop following man and start following God. And God, our relationship with God is individual. We each have a relationship with Him. And we each have the Holy Spirit to teach us. But how do you respond to those that would say, with all the different varieties that the Holy Spirit has led them, each one of them, to their own interpretation, Larry. I mean, these people have good intentions. They have, and yet they say the Holy Spirit has given them this interpretation. How do you deal with you that? you want to hold the questions till the end, Larry? Oh. Mm -hmm. Hello. Hi, Jeanette. Mm -hmm. I think it, 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 it breaks your flow. Okay. You know what I mean? Gotcha. I know that question. You need to get that answer. <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 you can wait. You want to hold questions till the end, Larry, would be easier. Okay, okay. You, if you can do that. Yeah. Um, I show restraint. Okay. <laughs> um, this has been uh, difficult for me because people don't want to hear it, but I emphasize that if we're serious about survival, we need to get on with bringing our resources together and putting together a community that we can sustain each other. We're not going to be able to do it on our own. Mm -hmm. um, I do want to say that um, I've been working on, uh, I hope that, that something in this part of the country would form. Um, I believe that because God has been raising me for this particular time, for this particular work, uh, He might, uh, I'm amazed, but it's possible he could be using me all over the United States. I may be doing some traveling, I may be all over the United States because there's people all over that need uh, that need some help with this. There's some people right now that want me to come out to California, people that want me in West Virginia. Um, I um, have been uh, realizing that God may use me to go to travel around the United States, but uh, I do. It's my intention on helping people with this, helping them to get set up, helping them to get started, whatever I'm capable capable of doing. Um, but we need to go in this direction. It's uh, high time. The hour is late, and so we need to pray to seek God's face and to see how we can go about doing this. Um, together we can stand in the Lord Jesus Christ. We can't stand on our own. Too many commune situations, uh, people have corrupted it. Man has corrupted it. I've seen a lot of communes where one family's taken it over and they live like royalty while everybody else lives on the jump change that's left. I've been in those communes, I've been uh, associated, you know, uh, I've seen those communes and those communal situations. Uh, I've seen talk to people that were tired of them, tired of being used. We are not uh, this even the church system. I've talked to pastors and and I say, how come pastors have a problem with finding somebody to talk to when they have a problem? They're in a body of Christ. And the pastor's remark to me was, "You mean I should take my problems to a congregant?" Well, I'm sorry, but this is the body of Jesus Christ. We're all the members of the body of Jesus Christ. There's nobody better than anybody. And when you become a minister in the body of Jesus Christ, as it says in this book, you become a servant. If the King of Glory can come to, down to man and make himself a servant, then surely we could be a servant to one another. That's not too far for us to go, but look how far the King of Glory came to kneel down and wash our feet. That's what. That's the direction that He gave us, and if we become uh, leaders and we become servants, we're not above anybody. Uh, now God, as I was saying, God has 
sometimes he wants he uh, he wants me to speak to pastors, and I think, well, that's you know, I think me, Lord, why would a pastor want to hear me? And they don't. <laughs> they don't. They show me the door. We don't, you know, they show me the door, but God uses the foolish things to confound the wise. Amen. <laughs> now what they're waiting on is the somebody that looks like a game show host. <laughs> if you look like a game show host, they'll listen to anything you want to tell them. They'll make the speaker special meetings. We got a game show host here, folks. Come and look at him. He's so beautiful with that pinstripe suit and all. It's showtime. Don't forget the big smile. Yeah, I call that the man of the hour show. A brand new car. You don't look like money. You don't look like money, Larry. Well, that's why I, I get. That's what I call myself uh, the. Uh, Secret shopper. <laughs> the pastors don't hide themselves with me. They don't put on airs because I'm not of value to them. So they just treat me like I was trash. And I mean, you know, those that do that, they don't consider me valuable. But you don't realize who you're talking to. Where it says to, to not be forgetful to entertain strangers. We don't know who we're talking to. Angels unaware. Angels yeah. unaware. Mm. We don't know. We're, we could be talking to a real servant of the Most High God. Amen. And that is an honor to be a servant of the Most High God. I am from out of the 60s when uh, <coughs> there were so many people lifting themselves up as spiritual. You got all them people from overseas coming and they're all spiritual and they all... You know, but I was out on the road, out in the wilderness, out in the miles from nowhere by myself one day, and I was thinking about all these people that say they are of God when really they have nothing except a, a show that they're trying to put on, lead a commute or whatever they're trying to do. And I was thinking about them and thinking, wow, you know, it seems like, I mean, is there somebody real out there that... that really works for the true and living God. And I thought, wow, what a, what a job. If you were a true servant of the true and living God, what a job. Man, that would be worth a whole life to have that position. A true servant of the true and living God is the greatest thing that anybody could attain to. That's what we want to be is a true servant of the true and living God and stop all this fake man stuff. So, uh, I uh, thank you all for allowing me to speak this night, and uh, I want to emphasize that the first church uh, in, in, uh, in Acts, second chapter, and all that believed were together, and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. Now this is uh, part of uh, a teaching in Malachi. The Lord teaches what the tithes and offerings brought in are for. And here's His first priority for bringing in the tithes and offerings that God says after He says in the same chapter, he's the God, He is God that changes not. I appreciate Malachi for speaking verbatim for God. I appreciate His ministry. He spoke verbatim. And God says that you've robbed Him. They said, how have we robbed you, God? He said, your tithes and offerings. He said, bring ye your tithes and offerings into my storehouse. That there may be meat in mine house. He wants the poor that come to worship Him, those in need that come to worship Him, don't go away empty. He wants the needs to be taken, to be met and taken care of. But they've changed that. That's the second, you know, that's down the line. That's sort of the last thought. Any poor comes here, we take care of them, man. We got a shoebox full of beans down in the basement. We'll stick out their head and, you know, and pray for them. When they may not need beans. They might have a cupboard full of beans. 
Maybe they're having trouble buying shoes for their child, or maybe, just maybe, the brakes on their car aren't working so hot. Maybe their tires are bald. God said in the Malachi that He wanted us to bring our tithes and offerings that there would be uh, meat in His storehouse. They say, well, wait a minute. Uh, don't we have to put... Uh, we, we need the lights. We need the heat. A church, one time I was, a, I was assistant pastor of a church and they showed me the door right away. <laughs> he asked me He asked me in front of the congregation, he thought I was going to support him. He had this big building program. We were going to buy a $100,000 building and, and uh, they thought that uh, the carpet and the air conditioning uh, you know, would bring more people and we'd have a bigger, our church would grow. And he asked me publicly, what I thought about it in front of the congregation, and so I answered him publicly. And I said, if God ain't going to be here, we don't need no carpet or air conditioning. <laughs> we need God is what we need. If people want carpet and air conditioning, you can go down the road. they got a beautiful building down there with carpet and air conditioning, if that's what we're looking for. We don't need carpet and air conditioning. We don't need a building. We don't need lights unless we're doing it God's way and what He says. Amen. That's the lights are not the first priority. The heat is not the first priority. We don't need a building if we ain't going to do it the way God says. The first priority is what God says. So I believe in that we need to do it God's way. But it's time we realize the American dream has become the American nightmare. And it's time that we got serious about a community. And we got serious about bringing our possessions and our what we're building together and taking care of one another. Somebody has a problem with their car, or somebody has a problem with their that we uh, we work to, we begin to work together as a community and go in that direction. And we bring whatever uh, God has placed in our hands, and we use it for whatever God needs. Um, and uh, we take care of each other is the only thing that's going to work. All, nothing else is going to work. If you set up by yourself, it'll work for a little while. But that's temporary. And I don't, myself, I don't want anything that's temporary. But I do know that working with people, that's one of the greatest things of having a community. Is that we have to learn how to love one another is what the, the Lord gave us to do and it wasn't just all exporting it. He said to love one another. We need to learn that first, but our competition society that they brought the competition into the church can't learn that because you can't have competition and the love of Christ. They don't work together. But they believe about business. They bring business in the church and business is going to run the church and where it comes down to the Word of God or the business... God wants us to be good stewards, so we're going to stick with the business. We've got to alter the Word of God, or we've got to uh, figure out who, what it's really saying, or whatever their mind justifies in changing. They've altered and changed the Word of God. But I had to, I had to tell a pastor, um, you know, after the... I was thinking, man, this guy's teaching these people not right. This isn't what the Word is saying. But I thought, oh well, that's their church, that's their business. So on the way out that morning, he was at the door shaking hands. I had to tell him, I said, that's false doctrine. <laughs> Amen. And he about ran out of the building. <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> but God uses me to speak to these people, and uh, I have to I have to do it because we're not playing a game anymore. We're in the last days at the end of time. So um, we uh, we need a community. That's going to be how we're going to survive. And the quicker we get on it, the better set up we're going to be. Because uh, because when we're scattered. It's going to be harder to set up a community. 
So we need to go in that direction seeing that, that our safety is of the Lord and the Lord wants us to be a community. The Lord wants us to learn to love one another. He wants us to learn to feed one another and to shelter and to take care of one another. He wants us to use our talents for one another. There's all kinds of ways we can use our talents. Uh, just real quick, uh, <coughs> this uh, I talk about buying these buildings. We, uh, some of these uh, large buildings, we could build apartments, help one another build apartments, and have crafts to produce uh, handcrafts, and uh, and then uh, sell these handcrafts. And different people have talents on using the internet or whatever means are available to. Uh, to sell these things. We have people with different talents and if we bring all these talents together we have the uh, opportunity of having a business together. We get to work with those that we love. Or we get to produce a product together with those that we love. One person cutting, one person sewing, one person boxing, one person selling. Uh, we have the opportunity. And in the uh, uh, in the peace and love I'll just throw that in real quick. Uh, we have the opportunity to provide of producing many peace and love articles such as clothing, uh, jewelry. Um, we have the opportunity of producing this in a, in a production line with one another every day. And the marketing has already been done for us. There's peace signs right now in every department store in America. Peace signs are all over the America and on the school clothes. But all their peace signs and all their peace and love clothes are getting from China. It's all replicas. We who understand loving our fellow man and loving one another have the opportunity of, uh, with our, the art ability that the Lord gave us to produce original pieces. The marketing has already been done. All we have to do is tap the market. Right now, there's been marketing done all over the United States, and it's all been paid for. <laughs> and so, if we tap into that marketing, we can produce original stuff, which is not uh, which is better than the copies. All China can do is copy. They don't know anything about loving people, real love, and and uh, so. So we have the opportunity of having our own business, having our own living situation. I, I was in a commune, just a quick story, I hope I'm not boring anybody, but um, at this one commune that I was in, we only had one car with 25 people. I was the driver of the car, and so I took everybody where they needed to go, and we provided all transportation with one vehicle at that time. I thought I'd tell you the, the humorous story on how I became the driver. <laughs> I learned how to drive not from any schools or any books. I learned to drive from stealing cars. <laughs> I thought I knew how to drive because I could start one and get it in gear. So, but getting out on the highway was a much different thing. So I learned to drive on my own without any kind of education. Uh, I was uh, out on the highway one time, and it's back in the old days when the speed limits were a little bit higher than they are today, and I had a carload of people from this commune that I'm in, and we're cruising down this highway at, at about 90 mile an hour. I'm driving, <laughs> and I'm, I'm just cruising, just flying, you know, and passing people in. And uh, so I'm cruising along about 90, you know, everything's smooth, and I noticed up ahead... <coughs> All the traffic, the cars were getting over into the fast lane. There's two lanes, fast lane and slow lane. And all the cars were getting into the fast lane. And they were all getting over there. And I figured, well, what the heck? If they don't want that lane, I'll use it. So, so I, I didn't have that much experience of driving. But I figured, well, you know, if they don't like that lane. So I got over there, and I'm cruising about 90, and I realized why they changed lanes. Is there was a stop tractor trailer in the lane. So I'm coming up on this tractor trailer at about 90 miles an hour when I took my foot off the gas and I stomped on the brakes and my wheels locked and I'm still, we're still flying at the back of this tractor trailer at a very high rate of speed. <coughs> well, the Lord blessed me with this ability that I can see things in slow motion. 
So while this is happening, I'm seeing it happen in slow motion. And I saw a hole over along the shoulder of the road, so I whipped it over and went around the truck and came out in front of it. So when it came time to the, you know, with the commune, when they needed a driver, some people said, I'm not riding unless Larry's driving. <laughs> so, so, so they, they, uh, they made me their driver. Um, I, could, I could tell you another humorous story about my driving if you want to hear it. Go ahead. Sure. It's just humorous, and I like to add some humor if I can. Um, I was 15 years old, and I, I told you all my driving experience was from stolen cars. I didn't have any kind of education. Nobody told me nothing. I just kind of was learning it myself. Uh, I can still remember that guy's face when I made that right hand turn out of the left lane. <laughs> I can still remember the look on his face as he was about ready uh, anyway, <coughs> anyway, uh, I'll tell you the story real quick. Me and Jigen down the highway on Route 80 it was. I'm 15 years old and I'm me and Jigen and a guy stops in a little station wagon and he picked me up and he was driving along and he said, do you drive? I said, yeah. He said, oh great. He said, <laughs> I was, uh, Wanting to rest. He said, I've been driving a long way. I want to get some sleep. So if you could drive a while, I'd crawl in the back, take some sleep, and, you know, that'd be great. I said, okay, sounds good. <coughs> so he pulls over, and he crawls in the back, and he's making his bed and all. And So I got in a driver's seat, and I'm, you know, I um, started out smooth, and I thought, that's great, you know, <laughs> nothing jumpy. Uh, so anyway, I got on the highway and I thought, well, this is, you know, an open highway. What, you know, possibly could happen? I mean, everything, you know, it's, it's not much traffic, open highway. So I got her up to about 60 mile an hour and I'm cruising along. He's back there sawing logs and, <laughs> and uh, I wasn't that, I wasn't that much used to highway driving. I'd driven in the city some, but uh, I had this problem that I hadn't thought about. But I should tell you beforehand, is that one of the cars I stole back in the day, it had power brakes. Well, I wasn't used to power brakes. I didn't know what they were. So the first time I tried to stop for a red light, I about beat myself to death with the windshield. Because I'd hit that brake and it'd throw me into the windshield, bam, and I'd fall back in the seat and I'd hit it again, bam, I'd fly into the windshield and the people around me thought I was nuts, which they were right. But anyway, so I, brakes scared me. I had them power brakes, they scared the out of me. And so, anyway, I'm driving along and about 60 mile an hour and he's back there sleeping and I started seeing these barrels in the middle of the road and I thought, what idiot put barrels in the middle of the highway? <laughs> and I'm looking at these barrels and they start taking me off of the exit. And the exit's one of those, it's a clo clover leaf, and it's one of them hairpin turns. And I'm clipping along at a pretty good rate, wondering where these barrels are, what the hell, some idiot put barrels in the road. So I was following the barrels and turned off on the ramp, that hairpin turn. Well, I started off of there, but I'm going it very fast. I'm probably going 50 mile an hour, and uh, I was afraid of the brakes. <laughs> and, and so as I'm going off this curve, I'm thinking, well, it's probably too late to break anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I go off the ramp, and I'm trying to keep it on the road, though. So we're squealing and squealing, and I got it up on two wheels, man, but I stayed <laughs> on the flipping ramp. And then we got around the curve, and... I'm coming down to the end of the ramp and I finally got it stopped, got over to the side of the road. And this guy, he he was he didn't come up for a while. He probably thought it was his last day on earth. He didn't stick his head up. But we sat there a little bit and finally he says, It's okay, he says, I think I got it now. <laughs> so got what? Driving. Oh, thank you. You think he was gonna take his driving back over. Yeah. So anyway, I give him his car back, and I said, 
I said, if you want me to drive again, I will. He says, oh no, I think I got it. <laughs> he probably never let anybody drive his car again. But uh, that was some of my driving experiences. But um, let's, uh, let's consider going in the direction of uh, community, living together and working together, providing for one another and taking care of each other as a community. And the community can only be put together the way that Jesus Christ established, which is the first church. That's the community we need. And that's the community that's going to get us through is what He established for us and what He gave us, the gifts that He gave us, is what's going to get us through this time of not being able to buy or sell. We'll be able to take care of ourselves. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Questions? Questions. 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 You and I have talked. Um, there's never been a better time for Christian patriots to start intentional communities. How do we network and find one another to come together? I mean, can somebody start running an ad on Craigslist of Christian patriots wanting to start an intentional community and then maybe somebody has some land and maybe we can... I mean, what do we do? How do we get started creating well, an intentional Christian patriot community? Well, the first thing uh, I believe that we need to do is uh, is to realize the direction we're going in and uh, beginning to love one another and take care of one another. And uh, we have to work with what we have in our hands. I don't believe in advertising or bringing in a bunch of people right away. I believe in, in what we have and working with who we have and what we have um, to begin to establish and uh, with the intention, the intentional community uh, intending to go that direction and learning to love one another and to see one another's needs and to take care of one another's needs. Like I don't know, uh, I, I know that, uh, that Jeanette was having a problem with her car. And uh, we could be looking at what one another's needs is and seeing how we could help. You know, like uh, if we uh, if we all chipped in five bucks, we don't know what, what kind of situation she's in. Maybe she's a little tight. Maybe we need to chip in a few bucks a piece and we could pay a mechanic if none of us were mechanics. But we need to start taking in one another's needs and realizing that's our sister, that's our brother, and we need to begin to love one another by their needs our needs. And networking. And uh, so that's, we just need to begin to move in that direction. We don't have to, you know, get, uh, we don't have to uh, get ahead of ourselves or get the cart before the horse, but we need to go with what we have uh, right now. The main important thing is that we love one another, and so that's what we have to learn because our community ain't going to happen, ain't going to work unless we learn the love that the Lord gave us. and we, So we have to learn to esteem one another as better than ourselves. And that we're loving one another so that we're, we're looking and we're aware of needs. That's one of the things of the church. They're so afraid that, well, if somebody has big needs, I might have to do this or that. Uh, many people that are learning humility, they don't run around with their, you know, just telling everybody their needs. There's those people that come, yeah, I want you to take care of this for me. I want gas for my car. I want food. I want this. I want that. Those aren't the people that we're looking for. And that's not what, but if we do it the way that Jesus Christ has given us, that we're learning to love one another, that's the job of the deacons. Is the deacons were to look for needs and to see needs. Many times you'll see needs, the person's not saying a thing, but you can see the need. You can see uh, somebody's car, if they bring their car in and they put a chunk of wood under the wheel, well that tells you something. We need to be able to see in the needs as though it's our uh, member of our body. We're many-membered body. So we need to move in that direction and it has to be... Uh, we have to make progress. The thing about the, the many of the churches is they just used to hearing messages. They just come and somebody speaks a message and they walk away, oh that was a good message. 
We're not used to doing anything. But uh, with what God tells us, we cannot ignore. What God gives us, we need to go in that direction. That's how we need to adjust what we're doing is by the messages that come from God, uh, knowing what He's speaking to us through the Spirit. And we need to act upon it and change in our, and let it be life-changing to us. So I would say uh, in this uh, group right here, to begin to, uh, to those that want to uh, participate, those that want to be part of the community, to um, they're a brother and sister, they're part of the body of Christ, and we need to uh, to love them as we love ourselves, and esteem them as better than ourselves, because if God takes care of us, He values us, He shows us our true value and what we're worth. He looks out after us, so we can be free to look out up to other people without being afraid of losing out or missing out or shortchanging. Um, that's one of the things that uh, it's it's tough when you're trying to deal with the world and you're trying to learn Christ. It's tough sometimes because the world will eat your lunch. They'll take advantage of you. And um, together, we in love, we won't be taking advantage of each other. We'll be encouraging each other. And be helping one another. So that's what God wants us to do. That's what Jesus Christ told us to do. God says He gave us these gifts of apostle and prophet, and that's what we need. That we can't do it with half the gifts. We can't do the full job. So um, the community is the way we have to. Uh, well, if we want to survive, if we want to eat. If we want to survive, we have to go into taking care of one another and loving one another and doing it God's way is the only way it's going to work. In His community, He already planned that. Jesus Christ already put it together. And we need to go back and reestablish Christ's plan and get away from man's plan. The, the uh, churches have gotten off course and they're not producing the fruit that God wants them to produce. God is, is a, God wants the church to produce its own ministers. And we have that opportunity as the body of Christ. Is there another question? Yeah, I'd like to add something. Uh, you, you know, you mentioned uh, you know, the layout of the building with the different craft shops and whatnot, the candle making and so forth. But uh, one thing, and maybe you just didn't mention it, but I hear a big missing in that is uh, more uh, industrial kinds of things like uh, metalworking, uh, tool and die making, uh, you know, those types of things. Transportation, yes. communication. There's uh, right now, I've been uh, learning how to make uh, solar distillers. Solar distillers, you make them about this large. It's like a box made out of wood with a glass top on it. And you, all you do is set it out in your yard and put water in it, winter or summer, and it produces, it distills water with the energy of the sun and runs it into a bottle. And it's free energy. I'm learning how to make uh, uh, stoves that you can make out of just tin cans, out of bean cans, and oh, out of yeah. different things making stoves. Mm -hmm. that, that Rocket stoves. Rocket, you get stove, rocket yes. stoves too. That's a That's, you know many different kinds of stoves. Mike, what's a rocket stove. A rocket stove is something that puts out a whole lot of heat with very little fuel. Right. right. Oh really? Yeah. The stoves that I yeah. yeah the stoves that I've been investigating are ones that you can use twigs so you don't have to you don't have to carry your own fuel with you. Right. It's all every woods has the, all the fuel that you need just using twigs on these little stoves. You can cook your food or heat your water or whatever you need to do. Mike. How about dried up grass? Yeah. 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 And, and, it's uh, like paper. So, uh, as a matter of fact, I was just on a Boy Scout site and I was learning how to make a, a minnow trap out of a two liter bottle. Minnow, you catch minnows with a two liter bottle, how to make a minnow trap out of it. Uh, 
we could be learning all these things, whatever talents the Lord gives us. Well, what can you use minnows for? Can you use them for uh, bait. Like, bait. Bait, fish bait? Bait. Okay. Yeah. Even worms or uh, what kind of bugs? Any, anything we can use. Uh, I've been learning about uh, the uh, uh, the magnetic motors. They're so far. There's so many people that are so far advanced now in magnetic motors. They're actually producing them. They're actually be beginning to produce motors that work off their own. Now, this generator type motors, or what are they? Uh... Yeah, generators and. Uh... So they're, they're so you can use these. Mag I don't know anything about magnetic motors. Well, so. right, yeah, right now. Uh, they have small ones, only up do is make them bigger, basically. I guess they're magnets. Figure out a way to use that. Magnetizing of the magnet. Yeah, the power, there's power in the magnets. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're learning how to, I know that it's possible to make a magnetic motor. I've built it for years, but uh, I haven't had the time to work on it. But I see other people right now on the internet go through there and look at some of these and they're coming up with some fantastic uh, plans and uh, uh, about these motors. And they're actually getting the motors to work producing uh, energy with nothing other than magnets. Wow. And if you make a motor turn with magnets, it's going to produce electricity. Oh, no fossil fuels. If you take a motor, well, I, I don't want to get into, uh, I'm not here to yeah. tell you about magnetic motors right now, but, uh, but yeah, it is. we need to uh, I what it looks like. go in the direction of community. And I would like to be a part of that, and I would like to help with that and, and uh, use my talents that God has, that's what <laughs> God has been preparing me for this time. And, uh, and uh, so I'm going to be... Uh, uh, working in community and in this area uh, with whatever God has me to do and uh, I might be used in different parts of the United States but uh, I want like something I, I would like to see something start in this part of the country and I'd like to uh, um, to see it happen with us those that love Jesus Christ and those that um, love their brothers and sisters. We have the uh, opportunity of being a real family, not this. Uh, I, I might seem a bit sarcastic or something at, at times, but I'm just trying to be real and, and maybe I come across wrong at times, but I tell them in the churches that as far as learning love, what I see here is what you get at the bank. <laughs> on hot dog day. Hot day. <laughs> you go to the bank on hot dog day, they open the door and they smile in your face. How are you today? Come over <laughs> here and have you fix yourself a hot dog. Here, you have some crackers. You know? And, and that's what you get at church. Now if I go to the restaurant, the lady, this sweet lady comes and she says, well let me show you where to sit. Oh, what can I get you to drink? Well, this is, you know, this is the same stuff you get at church. I'm saying that, that if this is the Lord Jesus Christ didn't come to smile in our face and open the door for us. There's a much greater the thing that the gospel's talking about than just smiling on each other's face and helping them open the door. We This love that we're talking about that they're trying to ship out all over the world, we do not have it in here. So we need to have it with one another, this real love, which is esteeming others better than ourselves and taking care of one another. So uh, let us move in that direction. And, and, and it, so if we get the, uh, as we get the growth and the income and the ability, we can look into getting a building together or uh, this particular one is out in the woods and so nobody really knows it's there. It's all covered. You can't see it going by in the road. You have to know it's there. Maybe, you know, sometime if we're interested and we have the ability, we can go take a look at it and then investigate as to, you know, there's a farmer out there.
there. That How far is it off the road, Larry? It's off the road, uh, the, the width of a river. Really? Yeah, about the width of a river. And uh, it's right on the river, right in the bend of the river. Hmm. And uh, dropping a wheel in the water wouldn't be anything. We'd have a constant source of electricity. If that were the, if that were, but I'm thinking that uh, in the situation that it's sitting in now, it's not worth a whole lot to them. But the uh, structure, which is two foot thick of stone work, mm. and, and I looked that building over. There's not a stone missing. Mm. And then next to it is a smaller building that looks like a small cathedral, where you, you know it's got the cathedral ceiling in it, and uh, you could actually. It could actually be a place of worship, but uh, the whole place of it, 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 because of all the massive stonework, made it living quarters that would look like your best idea of what a monastery would look like. Any yeah. idea what it was made or used for at, at any point? Yes, it was uh, made as a maintenance uh, building for a coal mine. Wow! So they had all their equipment, their tools, and all mm -hmm. you know in there. It was cold around there. It was cold. Yeah, it was a cold mine. I'm figuring that we're going to have to be creative because if you can't buy or sell, there's going to be no renting. Renting's not only going to work for temporary, so we're going to have to use our minds in order to be creative. I have been investigating uh, gold mines around the country, gold mining claims. Gold mining claims right now are selling cheap and uh, for like a, a thousand or two. And uh, they're like 80, 140 acres or whatever. If you buy the mining claim, you have the rights to be on that property, to access the property. Because you have the mineral rights. You bought the mineral rights. You own the mineral rights. So you have the legal access to that property. For how long? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how long, but you own the mineral rights. You're buying the mineral rights, so I would imagine that that would be for a while. Uh, but uh, that's one of the things that I'm looking into. Uh, and also, if you buy the mineral rights and you have legal access to that land, uh, it's a possibility that, uh, well, I, it's actually not registered. The land's not registered to you. So, which is uh, good for for legal purposes. If they, you know, that it, it, you know, they can't uh, uh, make it difficult for you for land ownership. We have to look at some uh, it, it being creative. Uh, it's possible we could purchase, uh, which is, uh, you know, that's. I don't know what the longevity is in that. That can be temporary or uh, depending on what God arranges. Um, so, so I really don't know. But uh, whatever we put together and whatever we work on, if God has planned for us to work together to build the community because He established the first church. God has a plan for us to work together. Uh, we need to get on it. We need to, to go in that direction to get on it because we're already late in the game. And uh, so anything we try to establish on our own, keeping our own uh, unit, our own station wagon, and our own everything is not going to work. It's not going to fly. We're being priced out of the market as it is every day. The prices are, you know, and uh, so we're coming to a time when we're going to be priced out of the market. And uh, so, so we have to use our, uh, our creativity. And right now we have a lot of opportunity. 
I don't know what these opportunities, uh, how long they'll last or what we have, but, but we have to put our minds together now. And with, if we're working for one another without competition, we have the opportunity of, and we have God included, then uh, we have the opportunity of uh, fulfilling God's desire for His people because God has a desire for us. God wants us to survive. God wants us to make it through this time. He's, he, he is, uh, God is pleased when we don't want to take the chip. We don't want to cooperate with this system that's um, a murderous, whatever the situation is, people for oil, <laughs> culture yeah. that we live in. Sure. So, um, so I thank you. I'm glad that I got to express this. I believe the time's short, so I have to be honest with what uh, and uh, God has been uh, grooming me for this particular time. And uh, so I, for years, I, uh, some, a lot of the time I was quiet. I didn't say much because people didn't want to hear it. And I just got tired of telling them. I said, well, there'll be a time when people will be interested. Amen. We're getting to a time when, uh, when they, there's no choice in the matter. We got to be interested. So uh, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we have it all okay. We'll be selling them tomorrow. <laughs> Excuse me, George. Sorry. I was saying, uh, the We've got chili and broccoli over here. Can you put chili some in the dry pan? Did you make some? I'm going to open it. Yeah.